Hello, this is Silas, and I'm here again for... <laughs> what are we doing? We're doing Dish by Dish. We're doing Dolly Varden with my friend Steven. Say what's up to the people. Hello, everyone. Hope you're all well. Today, we're going to finish Dolly Varden. Today, we're discussing cocktails specifically. Yeah, so with... <laughs> With this series, what we do is uh, Stephen is a gourmand of sorts. He's also been in the food service industry. He also happens to currently reside in what is known by some as the world international uh, restaurant capital of the world, which is New York City. So uh, he goes to different places, talks about the things, you know, eats the foods, takes the photographs, and then he comes and he dishes on the dish. So what he normally does is he just sends me a document and then he kind of just read through it. And today we're talking about Dolly Varden, as Stephen mentioned. And uh, this is, I think it's this ninth or so restaurant that we've done. This was a lot in this series. If you really enjoy this series, if you like talking about food, going into the details of what's the dishes in this, and we kind of go on the sides like, oh, what is this? What's a caper? When were capers first called? Why were they there? Then we look online and we find different things. So it's just, it's just two guys talking about food that Stephen has eaten. And sometimes we talk about other things. Sometimes we talk about this. But yeah, tell us a bit about Dolly Varden and uh, how you found this restaurant and why we're doing this. Sure. So this this place um, actually is down the street from me. It's um, it, it was in the original House of Brews location, but it it um, after House of Brews um, closed, this opened in its place. It started to open during right before it started to open right before lockdown, actually. But um, but then, of course, lockdown happened. They couldn't open all that. They had to uh, stop. So that's when I went upstate with my family and everything. And then. I came back and then they were starting to reopen. So I saw once they were reopened, I decided to check them out. Menu really appealed to me. So I figured give them a shot and I, you know, I really enjoyed them. So been coming there since, since, um, yeah, now it marks about a year or so. Yeah. And in this series, what we normally do in the first one that we do, uh, we go a bit of an intro of it. We talk about the location, we talk about the menu, we talk about can you make some of these dishes. So definitely check out part one if you want to hear more of our thoughts and just the background and the things like that with it. But there's going to be a link somewhere below where you can find it. And this is what they say on the website for Dolly Varden. It says, the inspiration, creatively inspired by New York City's Gilded Age through the Roaring Twenties Jazz Age, Dolly Varden serves creative cocktails and elevated menus in Hell's Kitchen. The name Dolly Varden has always been a symbol of feisty endurance. Long before influencers, Dolly Varden was a cultural phenomenon inspiring fashion, theater, song, art, and commerce, conceptually based on the eponymous coquette concocted by Mr. Charles Dickens's decade earlier. Decades earlier. Sorry, by Mr. Charles Dickens' decades earlier. As another enduring symbol, Dolly Varden was one of the was also the name of the last passenger train locomotive to run up the west side of Manhattan, just blocks away. And one of the differences here, that's what they say at the thing. You can definitely check it out. There's a lot more in there. It's a pretty decent website. The menu is <laughs> maze balls. Just from him sharing the menu, it's like this looks really good. And we've done two parts in the actual menu, and this part is going to be finishing it up talking about the cocktails. And that's one of the different things with this uh, restaurant that we've done versus the other ones that did. I think maybe uh, Casa Lula was kind of similar as it being like primarily cheese based. And uh, this one is actually a bar restaurant where the cocktails are actually the things that they feature. But then you just happen to have a really good menu for food as well. So that's that's one thing we were kind of impressed with this. And as Stephen mentioned, this is one of the few places in New York City that actually started during the pestilence of unknown but unkind of specified origin that's kind of being found out that was actually research. And now we might to talk about that. But <laughs> so that was one of the places that had actually come up during that time. And has caught on where you have, unfortunately, some of the ones we've even talked to talked about, like DB Bistro, is still not open again from actually having been shut down. Some places Stephen worked found pretty much the end in there, even though he was the manager that has shut down a few different places. But yeah, so any other thoughts that you want to Dolly Varden before we get into the actual uh, the actual thing? 
Not really. I mean, one thing I was going to say that's funny is when I first went there, I used to always drink beer and wine, and they kept telling me to try cocktails, and eventually <laughs> I did, and I ended up sampling all of them uh, because they're known for their cocktails. And like I said, like the like with the food, the cocktails are definitely above average. Like I think you can go there and get like you know Manhattan gin and tonic standard stuff. Like they'll make it for you if you ask, but it's like but they have a lot of stuff that they feature that is more interesting, and I, I would rather get those things because I mean those classic cocktails. I mean. They're not, they're good, but I mean, it's like if I can make them, like I could just buy all the ingredients and make them at home. It's like, what's the point, you know? Yeah, that's one of the things that I think of and think Stephen does as well. When you're at a restaurant, you kind of think, I'm going to order something to see if they're putting a different take on something that you make already so you can get some ideas. Or there's another one to do is you're going to order things that you're probably not going to make at home alone because it's going to take a lot of ingredients to actually make this. And if they're already doing it, it's like a it's like a 10 ingredient dish with like 12 different steps to actually do it. It's like, okay, like different kind of cuts, different kind of chops, different, like you need to boil it, then you need to fry it, then you need to put some part in the oven. And you might as well be like, okay, there's a lot of work going into this versus just like, yeah, I'm going to get French fries and like grilled chicken. It's like, okay. <laughs> I mean, you could do that at home at any time pretty much. So that, that's one of the things I consider. And the food has actually shown that this was a place where there's a lot of thought and um, some creativity going into the dishes. So I'm kind of excited to see what what they have here in the cocktails. And Stephen will be telling us which food he had with these for the ones that he remembers. And you can go back to the rest of the series and see like what the foods actually were with those, right? Yep. And I was just I was just going to add to like, that's what I've said about food as well. I was saying to somebody, they were asking me about the other place we'll probably discuss next one if by land two, if by sea, they were saying, is it worth the money? And I was saying, I think so. But my thing is, it's a question of if I'm getting what I pay for. Like I spent a little bit of money on Christine's birthday dinner. But my thing is, if it's like a one time thing once in a while, I don't mind it, but I wouldn't go there regularly on my own because it's not worth the money but then i have i've said certain places like little italy i won't go to because it's basic italian american food that i can make myself for cheaper so it's like even even i mean it's a lot cheaper than one if by land or other places but still it's like i could easily make it on my own for less so what's the point uh. yeah so that's the thing that's with this we're going to get into the the drinks now if you all have had any drinks similar to this or get some good ideas, just let us know. Let us know in the, in the menu section. Or if you've actually been to One If By Land, not One If By Land, to Dolly Varden. And um, and yeah, if you've been to Dolly Varden and you've had some of these, uh, let us know. Or if you've had something similar, these seem to be more signature type of things, but we'll see yeah. if there's stuff that you've had uh, similar somewhere else. Okay. So we'll just jump into the first one, and the way we do this is I just read the thing, and you send me the document, read the kind of thing, and then we kind of just go back and forth. So jumping into that right now. So Pomp Goes the Whimsy. Pomp Goes the Whimsy is the first mm. one. So this is Pomp and Whimsy Gin, Lime, Mint, Egg White, and uh, there's two versions here. There's one that's going to have, uh, the second one's going to have a, it's a new version with caramelized sugar instead of the blood orange chip. I'm a blood orange fan, but I'm also a caramel fan. So I don't know, but yeah. How how much does that actual addition have to do with the cocktail? Um, I mean, I think it was just sort of tweaking the presentation and fooling around. Like if you notice the difference mm -hmm. in the quality of the photos too, the first one was on my iPhone 8, second one was on the 13. So it looks a lot nicer. I think they just try to mix it up too because they, they're they very good here about asking about feedback. And I think it's also people get tired of certain things. So they try to add little new things just to sort of tweak it up that way it's like it's a little more interesting so i think it's pretty self-explanatory you can taste the lime um the lime and uh the gin flavor i mean yeah i think most people who know who've had gin they know it's quinine flavored i always compare it to evergreen whipped egg whites put on top last minute so you can see they separate like that and then there's the mint leaf and also first off it's the blood orange my sense is the blood orange was probably soaked in simple syrup and then dehydrated so the idea is it's still a little tart because you have the zest there, including the white pith of the orange, but it is a little sweet too. But it's not too sweet because you don't want it to be, it's supposed to be a little tart to offset the drink a little. And then with the caramelized sugar, it is some caramelized sugar, but it's a small piece. That way it doesn't make the drink super sweet either. Yeah, so mm, I'm wondering what made them think instead of having that tartness to, to offset the drink, they go with something that's actually sweet based. I, again, I think it might be feedback because, like, for example, we'll get into another cocktail below and they were asking me, oh, do you think this needs something? Do you think this could use needs another flavor? Because some people were saying certain drinks, they complain the flavors are too one dimensional and it's they were trying to find that balance of we want flavors that work well together. But 
at the same time, we don't want to do things that are too contradictory or convoluted because like with food and Thomas Keller talks about this is you don't want to put a, you don't want to put too many contradictory things into one item. Cause then the flavors get very confused and you kind of don't know what they're striving for. Whereas if you have a few simple flavors that work together, it's a much better. Yeah. So which one did you prefer? I, do you mix, I guess you mix the caramel into it. You also mix the, you dip the blood orange into it, or do you have the egg white first? Like it's, it seems like, a, I don't know. How is well, this vibe? I mean, I, I just sort of let it sit on top, and I think I just pulled it off and ate it with some of the foam. Okay. <laughs> Both the caramel and the blood orange, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Then you just had the cocktail by itself. So yeah, pop and whimsy gin. I haven't had that. My, when I was still drinking, uh, Hendrix was my go-to gin. It was a cucumber base. I liked having the hang, uh, Hendrix and tonic, or or the hang, Hendrix mule, which is like it's like cucumber peels. You put those in there. Hendrix and some nice. Um, uh, there's like, I'm forgetting the name of it, Elder Tree, or I think it's Elder Tree Gin. It was just such a really good mix to have those three together. I hadn't really attempted to try too many other kind of gins. I had Bombay, of course, it's a typical one to have, Tangare, but hadn't heard of Pomp and Whimsy Gin. Oh, uh, yeah, I know I know what gin you're talking about. I'm trying to, oh, Fever Tree, that's what you're thinking of probably. Fever Tree, yes, Fever yes, tree, yes, that's yeah. it. Yeah, they've seen, I don't know, I, I'd have to try certain gins side by side. I mean... The only gin that really stands out in my mind, uh, we may discuss it in another presentation, actually, is the Empress gin. That's actually uh, the purple one. I forget, I forget where the color comes from, but like something like that is pretty distinct. But a lot of a lot of other gins, I mean, I think if I tasted them side by side, I could probably tell the difference. But uh, like, there, I don't think I've had any that like really stand out in my mind. Like, oh, if I had this next to this versus this. Um, like, like I, I don't think there are any gins that like that like really stand out. That if I were to have them next to three or four others, I could tell them apart. I, I would have to mm -hmm. do side by side tastings. I think. Yeah, yeah probably has stuff to do with that quinine taste of it. It's, it's a very, it's a very powerful, uh, powerful taste. Like gin tastes like gin. <laughs> well, 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 they taste like gin. Well, because I would say with gin, the botanicals and herbs are mixed up a little. But with something like vodka, vodka is designed to all be the same. Like it's funny. I always laughed. Like, like at um at Felitti, we would laugh because. People would be like, I prefer this vodka over this one. But the thing is, the ingredients are all the same. They're designed to all be, uh, you know, have the same same smell, like, you know, neutral, same taste. I mean, it's basically all vodka is designed to be a neutral spirit. It's not supposed to have a distinct flavor. I think I think it's absolute. They add a little bit of glycerol too to make it thicker. But that's it. Everything else, it's. Yeah. Actually, yeah, come to think about it. I'm thinking now, especially with the way you're supposed to take vodka, I mean, the suggested ways. You need to freeze it for at least 24 hours. It's supposed to get even a bit condensed and things like yeah. that. And it's it's amazing when you do it that way. Of course, it's, it's one of the early drinks that people get to find <laughs> in their younger ages. So it's something you had in college where yeah, it might might be slightly chilled, but you had mixing it in all these kind of drinks, this is smearing off and things like that. But once I finally actually had a, a decent kind of, a, like, even the abs absolute is not bad. It's common, but it's not bad. I was a big fan of the advertising campaign of it long before I even started drinking. But once you actually get that and you find out, yeah, you put it in the freezer, you get the frozen glasses, and you have it that kind of way, and just straight, even the United States supposed to add anything else to it, it's just a whole different take to that. Now, with gin, as I mentioned, maybe part of the reason I think gin just tastes like gin I think it's a strong taste as it is, but as I mentioned, I've only had, uh, what was that? Um, okay, there was another one I had here in Kenya. Um, so I've, I've had five different kinds of gin, so I can't really say too much with the different flavor expanses, but I think Hendrix was actually somewhat different because of that cucumber base on it. So yeah, they, as you said, so uh, what, what other kind of things do you think they mix in gin? So what's the typical kind of fruits, roots, plants that, the, that they base gin of, gins off of? Well, I've seen, like, for example, that's why gin and tonic, because tonic water has quinine in it as well, so the flavors kind of work together. Um, there's actually, I was thinking about in terms of pairing this, I actually saw uh, gin and tonic cured salmon. I thought that was kind of interesting, because the alcohol will sort of, quote-unquote, cook the fish a little. It gives it kind of a distinct flavor, but also helps break down the protein a little. So I thought something like that would be cool. I, I, I'm not really sure what you'd pair... Gin with, I mean, gin is one of those things I think you typically do it on your own. Maybe you could do it with certain things like that, but it's such a distinct flavor. I mean, if you were to if you were to douse it on a meat or something, it would just taste like gin. So, uh. no, I meant more like what what are the you know like uh, uh. tequila is made with the, the agave cactus, vodka is made out of the potatoes. 
you're saying with gin, they use different kind of uh, things to infuse the flavors into the gin. So what are the things that they normally infuse them with? Well, I'm trying to think here because, I mean, it's mostly... Yeah, it's mostly because, I mean, it's based on barley, uh, juniper berries sometimes, different grains. Yeah, juniper. I've seen coriander, angelica. Yeah, coriander. orange. Yeah. So it's hmm. it's it's one of those things. That I, I think that's what I'm getting at is that that's where these brands vary is that, like, some may have a little bit of coriander. Some may have some more juniper flavor. Some may have some more orange peel, all that. It's almost like I guess you can almost compare it to curry or something where – the basic like curry has to have turmeric, but then everything else kind of is tweaked a little. Like some will have cardamom, some will have ginger, some will have cloves, some will have a mix, all that. It varies a little. So I think broadly speaking, it has to be based off barley and have the quinine, but then everything else just kind of is tweaked a little depending on what the people want to do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So here from uh, BBC Good Food, they're saying, yeah, Delta Gin is a, it's a juniper connoisseur. Um, how do you make gin? And so there are the methods here to make them. If you want to make your own, how to make flavored gins, they have those in there. Yeah, it's also one of those neutral, neutral, um, neutral grain. So it's like neutral grain, like vodka. So it's vodka gin. Is tequila a neutral cactus? <laughs> neutral cactus thing? Or does, does that count? No, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, I don't know. I'd have to look up what classifies as neutral, though, because I always think of gin. I mean, I think of vodka as neutral because it doesn't really taste like anything on its own. But then, with Gin, I mean, the botanicals and everything give it. Here we go. Okay, so gin is made by distilling a neutral grain alcohol with juniper berries and other botanicals sense. to make a fragrance fragrance. So when you add the other stuff, it takes it from being neutral to, to something else. Okay, so you can also vary the recipe by adding different spices, fruits, and floral elements. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't drink anymore, but I can imagine myself getting older and like wanting to get not really old or really middle age, but I can imagine myself being more into like making different kinds of alcohols and gin combinations more than like, like some people might say, okay, do different botanicals like marijuana and stuff. Like I can imagine myself getting really into like making like single batch or a couple of batch different kind of like spirits and things like that. It seems like it would be an interesting thing to just play around with and try to see what, what you can get out of um, uh, different things. We can talk about in another, I don't think it's in here at all, but there's also Jabrovka, the Polish vodka. I like that a lot. It's made with uh, mm -hmm. buffalo, uh, what is it, bison grass. That has a very distinct flavor. It's mm -hmm. it's very smooth. It smells almost like coconut or almond. I actually, I got my dad hooked on it. It's funny because he's about half Polish by blood. And uh, <laughs> it, was a, it was a lady from Poland actually who brought it back. You can buy it here in the States. It's maybe 40 bucks for a bottle or something maybe like that big. Um, it's... It's 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 one of those things. I mean, I think it's technically vodka, but I kind of consider it its own thing because it has a distinct flavor on its own. But it, there's different ingredients, and then it's interesting too because it's one of those things that's deceptive. Like you got to be careful because it tastes really smooth, but then you actually, but then you ingest a bunch of it and it hits you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it's sneaking up on on people. Thing like that's definitely something that was was common and. In, in early drinking, not even early drinking, because so people still do that. They just like they, they're not really. That's, I think that's a happy hour type of thing, where it says, "Yeah, you have happy hour, happy hour." People are like smashing drinks to try to get the. Um, they're smashing drinks to try and get the actual um, <laughs> to get the what's it called, to to get under that that cutoff time, and then by the time you've finished, it hits you, and then you normally pro there's probably people who stay in a bit longer. Now you're paying the regular prices for things because <laughs> you're like, oh, you're already in there. Well, I think I mentioned it before, but that's what people used to do at Stumble Inn with $2 beers on Wednesday nights where they would get drunk and then they would buy rounds of shots for everyone. They'd be like, wait, why is my bill 60 bucks? But that's how they lure you in because it's cheap. So you keep ordering more, you keep drinking, and then you're like, then, oh, well, round of shots for everyone. Why not? And you look at your bill and you're like, and then if everybody does that, they make money. <laughs> yeah, <they> sneak <laughs> up on you. Okay, what did you have the pump and pump goes and whimsy with? I think I had this on it on my own, uh, just like sipping on it. I think I was okay. thinking to myself, I was trying to think of what it would pair with. There's actually a salmon dish on the menu, but it's like a sautéed salmon or something, or mm -hmm. a uh, grilled salmon. I was thinking this would go well with a cured salmon dish if they were to have that, mm -hmm. because I was thinking of the gin and also mint and stuff. Um, mint, mint, of course, is, mint is commonly paired with lamb, but I feel like I don't know. I think I don't think gin and lamb really would work together. The flavors are too distinct. What's the difference between curing and marinating? Curing, typically, it's dry. Like, typically, if, like, you cure salmon, it's salt, sugar, lemon zest, things like that, and it just sits in that salt and everything, and you pull it out and scrape it off. But marinating, it's usually there's liquid of some kind. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so moving on to the next one, we have here the Dapper Dan. This is a Nolets Gin, a Nolets Gin, Carpano Antica, Amaro Nonino, Luxardo Maracino, and a touch of dry vermouth. This sounds like some James Bondy type of thing. Uh huh. Sure. So this is a Carpano Antica. It's an Italian vermouth. That's the name of the company. It's it's a very distinct recipe. It's one of those like it's um they, it's it, it has a certain protection by law. I forget what it's called. Like wine has certain protections. The regional it, protections. It, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's slightly bitter. It has. Uh, it has different flavors on the palate. People have gotten different things from citrus, cherries, mint, raisins, root beer. It's a lot of people drink it straight on the rocks. People also put it in Negronis. You can serve it actually as a dessert wine, which is kind of interesting. I haven't done that, but I was thinking about trying that, just seeing what it goes with. Um, it's funny because I, I might have mentioned this in the past, but it was funny because my I used to always think of vermouth as just some kind of like blending drink. But my uh, my boss, who is Spanish, he he was always saying like he got mad when I said that and he's like, Oh, I'll give you some good, good vermouth. One of these days you'll appreciate it. And when I go, when I went to Huerta, sometimes I would actually get vermouth with my meal because there is good vermouth that's straight. It's just, I think here in the States, a lot of people just use, um, a lot of people just use cheap vermouth as like a mixer and drinks, but there is actually good vermouth that you can drink straight on your own. Yeah. Right. Yeah. For me, vermouth was, it's, it's a, it's a strong taste that I haven't really, I, didn't, I, didn't, I never really liked that much. And another one that I don't like, it kind of reminds me of vermouth. I, don't even, I can't even remember if it really tastes the same. It's like grappa. And maybe I'm just it because... Well, well yeah, grappa is a different... rough. Well, grappa is a different thing because with grappa, uh, you figure it's, it's, it's... They use the grapes, not just the grapes, but they'll even use twigs, leaves, all that stuff. They just throw it in and age it. So, for example, I had what Grappa made from Gewürztraminer at Babo, and it was actually pretty good because Gewürztraminer has, for those who don't know, it's it means it's spiced, spiced or perfumed Traminer. Tramino is a city in Italy, but it's it's big in Germany and Alsace. The one, it um, the. The grappa kind of tastes like that, but the flavor itself on the palate, it's on the drier side, but it smells mm -hmm. like the wine, like it has that kind of mango and rose overtone. So I thought that was kind of cool. But but grappa, it's definitely stronger. I, this, the grappa we tried in school, it was very, it was like very cheap stuff. Like I had it, I did not like it at all. It was like drinking gasoline for me. Yeah. But then I tried, but then I, but then I went out and I tried some good grappas and I came to appreciate them. And there's different grappas flavored with different things. Like I think I had... I'm trying to remember if there was a chamomile flavored one I had. Yeah, there is some interesting stuff out there. Yeah. I've had some grappa nonino. That that name kind of reminded me of the, of my experience of that. Yeah, it's I tried it just uh, I even tried it freezing it. It's it's just it was just wasn't for me. It just wasn't something that I have. But um, yeah, that, that happens. So there's some things where it's just the taste just doesn't doesn't go over on you. And what's this Luxardo Maracino? Maracino. Maracino. So that's so that's basically that's the uh, it's a liquor that you get when you distill the Marusca cherries, it's the basically like maraschino cherries. You've probably seen those. It's the liquor you mm -hmm. actually get like straining that off. You from you ferment that and that's the flavor. you Interesting. Get. Yeah. Hmm. So that's more of like a whole hog type of thing. But when it comes to, <laughs> when it comes to like vegetables and alcohol and things like that. Yeah. It's basically the idea of, yeah, you don't throw it. Like you say, you don't throw everything away. So you get that. This kind of just goes down to the whole thing we were talking about with with a. I know great people um, talk we had with with Laura talking about the d natural wines and what are the different things you can do. What are the different sorts of things? Why are wines based off of grapes rather than blueberries or raspberries? Why are those sherries? Why are those considered other things? Where does it switch from being a wine to being a spirit to being a liqueur or things like that? And there's yeah, you can pretty much ferment pretty much anything. So uh, there's probably still things that we still haven't discovered. You can actually make decent sorts of spirits and liquors and different alcoholic beverages out of. Yeah, and then I was just gonna uh, amaro nonino for those who don't know. Amaro is a bitter liqueur. Amaro actually means little bitter in Italian. It's it's actually made with grappa, and then there's different herbs, uh, fruits, and botanicals. So there's different flavors in that. There's gentian, there's citrus, there's there's different flavors depending. And this one, this one typically tends to smell and taste like there's usually orange, there's a little bit of honey, there's a little bit of um, some people will get pepper, things like that. But it has it has kind of a, it has a distinct bitter flavor to it as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, Di Sarono, I think, is the more typical. It's a, where it's an amaretto. Uh, with, yeah. That's a, that's an odd thing. I didn't really. I like Di Sarono, but that's an amaretto. So I think the amaretto is kind of adding the difference. It's a sweeter type of thing that goes with based off. I didn't know if it was based off of grappa. I didn't even know that until you said that. But yeah, so that just shows that a little change to something can can make something palatable rather rather simply. I don't know. Interesting, well, well, just the way taste buds work. Well, because I was thinking, too, I mean, grappa fits your whole hog idea, because like I say, I mean, you're throwing in twigs and leaves and stuff, so it's yeah. we're not just using the grapes, we're throwing in seeds, we're throwing in twigs, all this, and we're straining all of that off, but you have all the flavor from those things, so. Uh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, now that's why I think with some of these, I I don't really like these protection type of things they have in the, in Europe, because I still think even if you didn't have that protection, there would be something specific about growing things in a specific way, in specific soil, under specific like uh, environmental type of type of situations that can't just be copied. Even if somebody else can use the same technique somewhere else, it'll be a different sort of thing. And and I think I, I don't think that's still needed. I think you can still compete in the complete free market without having these protections and still be creating the best sorts of products. I don't understand why. I guess because some of them are saying, okay, people are using the names. It's a kind of like copyright, regional protection sort of thing. So somebody doesn't go off of the good name of this region by by claiming a lesser product is that and they besmirch the name. I, I don't know. I don't know really. It's there's, there's something about that that just kind of serves <laughs> like my individualist like and like an aqua free market itself. There's something about those protections. It's like ah, Europeans, goddamn it, yeah. Well, because I think I think it has to do with lot like in this country with the whole antitrust thing and all the other cronyism is that groups that are successful want to cement their status. So they lobby for all this stuff. And it's OK, we'll contribute to these politicians or whatever in exchange, make it so other people can't compete with us. So that's why in countries like France, as we've talked a little bit about French wine, the rules are very rigid. Like if it's from this area, it has to be in this area. It has to be these grapes aged this long, et cetera. But with Italy, there's all these exceptions because people were trying to skirt the rules. So <laughs> I always bring up uh, Chianti because, I mean, that was, of course, made famous by Silence of the Lambs. And the whole thing of Chi Chianti is the Sangiovese grape, but it has to be grown in the region. So what happened was it was Chianti, but then they started expanding the region. So the original region, it became Chianti Classico. And then if it's aged a certain amount of time, it becomes Chianti Classico Reserva. So it's like you see they kept finding ways to sort of skirt those rules. To, yeah. <laughs> yeah, as they should. As and then in, and then in France, it's funny because with Champagne or Champagne, as they say, they actually just expanded the region so they could produce more of it. So it has to be produced <laughs> in Champagne. Let's expand Champagne. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people will find a way. People will find yeah. a way despite it. The market will find a way. We will okay, find a way. So or, as, as Hannibal Barca said, we'll find a way or make one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I think the world has benefited from having yeah. these these more options. I think, yeah. Okay, so here we go. Now the next one is get figgy with it. Get figgy with it. Da, 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 da. Oh, I wonder if it's probably okay. This is fig, vodka, vanilla, and lemon. But now I'm thinking, like, what would be? I'm sure there's already cocktails named after the the Oscar slap. Get this. Get this drink in your wife's mouth. Would that be uh -huh. <laughs> the name of a cocktail? I don't, I don't know what it would be. But yeah, some some. So really, just that that information coming out about that family is tough. But I just thoughts 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 with Will Smith. Y'all should watch. He's could he could be could be on 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 the edge right now. But yeah. Um. So what's the getting figure? Oh, did you say what? What? Sorry. What, what drink did you have with with the previous one? I don't know if you told us that. What food? What meal? With the dapper dad. This, I think I think this was another one I just kind of had on its own. I was trying to think again in my mind because some of these cocktails, as we're talking about, have very distinct flavors. So I'm not really sure what they would pair well with. For example, most wines, most wines I think are broad enough that you can pair them with certain things. There are exceptions, like for example, Madeira. If you've tried that, Madeira has a very distinct flavor, and I remember. In school, my teacher was saying he's had it, I think, with duck and ham, and like that's it because it just has a very unique flavor. This is probably kind of a similar story. I'm not honestly sure because it's kind of bitter. It's, yeah, that's a tough one. I'd, I'd have to talk to somebody who, who has some recommendations. It's it was a good drink. It, it, it was a good drink, but it's like it, it's a very unique flavor where it's like, what would it work with? Yeah. Because uh. the grappa, the amaretto, those are normally like, um, they're normally like 
I don't want to say dessert wines, but they're things that are given to you after you drink. It's like digestive rolls. It's supposed to like help yeah. you like digest the, the the actual food that you have. So it's normally just by itself. At the end of the meal, some people will have coffee instead. Some people will have the, the grappa or limoncello or um, or uh, amaretto. So I think probably that's probably part of why it's not really an accompaniment that you're supposed to have with drink. And also you said that that the, te- the taste, the taste, it's a very, very strong taste. If you actually have that with food, it might completely cover any of your taste buds that are actually trying to deal with whatever dish that you're having. Yeah. Okay, so we can move on and get figgy with it. <laughs> so we can get figgy with it. We already said it was fig vodka. It was a uh, vanilla and lemon. So tell us a bit about this. I think this is pretty self-explanatory. I mean, figs, you can taste it in the vodka. Vodka itself is pretty neutral, so it tastes like figs, but obviously you taste alcohol in it. A little bit of vanilla in the drink itself. I'm not sure if there's vanilla extract or what they use because you don't see any of the vanilla beans in it. And then it's a little bit of lemon juice as well. Fresh slice of fig on top. This was this one was okay. I mean, I thought the flavor was a little mild, like maybe it needs something. I like figs a lot myself. I like vanilla and lemon too. But I mean, it's, you know, refreshing, but I, I felt like it could have used a little something. Yeah. Yeah. Like what? Maybe like a sprig of mint or something or some mint in there? Or just what do you think? Maybe... Well, some uh, if there were a way to make the figs stronger, like maybe do like some candied figs in there or mm. something like that, because because I grew up eating uh, dried figs, like my dad buys them a lot. But if you have those versus the fresh, the fresh are definitely milder. I like fresh ones a lot, but the problem is, I think when you mix them with vodka and other things, the flavor gets lost a little because the alcohol is so like stronger and the fresh figs are milder. So I think maybe something with candied figs or dried figs somehow incorporate those flavors. I think that'd be better because then you have the balance of the concentrated sweetness, but you have the alcohol as well. Like if you're going to have the frozen stuff, it's it's a cold drink anyway. Maybe if you get like a small disc of like uh, the, that figgy Newton type of stuff, the fig Newton yeah. type of like frozen fig. And you can have that inside, so it maybe diffuses slowly into the drink. That could be some one could way. Could do something like that. that, yeah. 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 I, for, I forget if I told you about this, but what some people were doing, I think it was at Botello or Kitchen Step, the sister restaurant of what was that like three jobs ago for me. They actually did this thing with drinks where they would they would take a flavored ice, they'd put it in the bottom of a cup, and you'd get glasses. I think they were like cups, not glasses that could freeze. And then you would mm-hmm. you would put it you would put it in the freezer, so there'd be this solid green like there'd be this solid green thing that was basically like flavored ice. And I think they even tilted it on the side. So it like went oh, cool. up at an angle and then you would pour the drink in that table side. So you'd see the drink on the table. There'd be this green thing going up and then there'd be the liquid. It was nice. And then the ice of course would keep the drink cool, but it would also slowly dissolve into the drink, which gave it, gave it flavor. I thought that was cool. Yeah. yeah I mean, and this, this is something I, I suggest people do, especially if you're somebody that drinks cocktails or do this, if you drink whiskey and things like that, Take some time, get some extra, just save up a bit and get those things to get those really big circle frozen things. If you're making drinks, shots, you can get those things to just have frozen shot glasses. That's the same thing I normally do. It's just like I have this metal um, <laughs> this metal water bottle. And what, what I normally do is I normally just keep it in the freezer overnight. So like during the day or the next day, I have like actual ice. And I normally like put it on the side. So it's like this ice all the way through. Then you can just like shake it up and you get in there. This is like a typical thing to do. And it's... But I guess, but maybe some people just take it for granted when you have the electricity, you have the access to all these things. The ice maker is not like a common thing in most, in many American homes. So they just kind of make the ice that way. But just looking into these things, if you enjoy something, there's a very few, few things you can look into your, if you, if you enjoy imbibing in alcohol and different kinds of things, there's, there's a few things you can look into. How is this alcohol best taken? What are ways of, what am I trying to achieve with this thing? And you can just step up your, experience with these spirits and liquors and wines and things like that just by putting in a little more research and a little more effort it really it really does step it up versus just like any glass any drink whatever because there's there's actually a difference that's something that i noticed there was an actual big difference between my early drinking days to the later days but when i was like okay now i'm doing this in a specific way as it's intended because there's a reason like the glasses are in a certain way there's the reason the temperature is in a certain way there's a reason it's supposed to come at a certain time in the meal and things like this there's actually key things in in that whole experience of uh, taking most alcohols over just even like beer i think there's, there's different things with them yeah yeah i gotta look it up but ray that was the beverage director of those two places i mentioned he was looking at some cool thing with there was there was eggnog, but there was an ice made. I'm trying to remember if it was like rum flavored ice or something. And it was around holiday time. And it was really cool because you poured it in. You saw this like brown, like you saw this like brown kind of like 
core in the middle of the glass, but then the eggnog would sit on top. But then that rum flavored ice would sort of seep out into the eggnog. Really cool. Like I'd like to experiment with stuff like that. Yeah. 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 As I mentioned, <laughs> I've even, even without going back to drink it, but I guess to taste them, I mean, you don't have to taste them. I could probably think of making these things without actually tasting, but it's just, it's, it's just a lot of fun things you can do with these. That it's, yeah, yeah, okay. So yeah, pretty straight, pretty straightforward. Y'all out there who are listening, can y'all think of something that might not uh, might spice this up? Might kick? No, <laughs> we're not going to say the kick it up thing. <laughs> might, might spice this up a bit. Might spice this to the next level. Get figgy with it. Take it to. I'm trying to think of other Will Smith songs. Uh, well, it, it's, fun, it's funny you say that because Christine brought up the Spice Girls the other day, so I thought of that song, "Spice of Your Life." <laughs> yeah, I can't even remember our "Spice of Your Life" because I was like. Every boy and every girl, spice up your life. Everybody, oh, okay, in the world so that, spice yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm gonna, which one is that? I wish you would be everywhere. I don't know. That's the only one I can really remember. Ignore know, that course, heart. Like, ignore that heart reaction. Okay, like and that. then no, of course, of course, the the if you want to be if you want to be my that was the first one. Yeah. You, Melby's nipples and everything in the video yeah. back in like the 90s. Like, what is yeah. going on? <laughs> back when nipples were like an amazing thing to see on TV. Now there's like filth, war, and filth. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, it was like, we I don't know if you saw, we were fooling around making reels and she uh, she was trying to come up with different songs. She was like, honey, what's Victoria Beckham's, what's what's her, the band's name? Like, oh, the Spice Girls. I was like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, my sister listened to that when we were like little kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so on to the next dish here. We have uh, the aristocrat, yep. which is four roses, bourbon, allspice, and lime. Sure, so this is a nice drink. I mean, I have a number of friends who are bourbon fans. For those who don't know, I think most people would know, but just to say it, uh, bourbon, it's an American whiskey. It's barrel age. It's distilled liquor made usually from corn. It tends to be on the sweeter side relative to other whiskeys. I mean, it doesn't taste like dessert, but I mean, if you compare it to rye or scotch or something, it'll definitely be on the sweet, sweeter side. They think it comes from the French bourbon dynasty, but they're not sure because there's a bourbon county, Kentucky. There's Bourbon Street, New Orleans, uh, which are also named after the dynasty. So it's not sure if it was them directly or if it was if it was the dynasty directly or those places it's not sure kentucky of course and tennessee are famous for it uh the name bourbon actually came out later in the 1850s and then uh in kentucky it was the 1870s so definitely so it's a four roses is just a brand it's fairly common fairly popular all spice for those who don't know it's it's a single spice, but the flavor has been described as a cross between cinnamon, nutmeg, and clove. So that's where the name all spice comes from. It's one it's one spice itself. If you look at the spice, it's this little round um ball almost, but it has those other flavors. And just there's a um lime, it's made similar to the blood orange above, soaked in simple syrup, dehydrated, and just put on top. So, you know, nice, nice, simple drink. Yep. Yeah, I remember one of my favorite cocktails was the old fashioned. It was also a relatively simple thing, but just like the way the ingredients work together just works perfectly. You don't really need too much more to it. So, yeah. So, that's the same thing. So, here with the allspice, you said it's like, how do they get it? They distill something into it, or it's like powder, it's mixed in there, it's ground up and mixed in. My sense, my sense is they probably uh, use a microplane, they take the fresh. Uh, it's called a berry, but it looks it's this round, hard thing almost yeah. like a seed. And they just grate it over top into the drink because they put the bourbon and lime juice in the shaker cup. They grate that in, shake it together, strain it out. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. the 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 alcohol leaches the taste out yeah. from the powder. Okay, okay, yeah. So I see that. Yeah, but yeah, I, I've never had allspice, so I, I can't really think. Well, as you probably know too, the thing is, fresh spices are much more potent than uh, mm -hmm. the powdered spices. If you have if you have fresh nutmeg versus the powdered stuff, it's a world of difference. Like I remember when I first used fresh nutmeg, actually at seasonal, we'd put it on the spatzel. A lot of Germans are big on putting nutmeg on potatoes as well as certain pastas. You have mm. you have the you have the whole kernel. It's maybe about this big or so. You only need a little bit. It's so strong. You just take a microplane, grate a little bit. Pretty potent. It flavors the whole thing. The powdered nutmeg tastes like dust. Like you need like a lot of it because it's been sitting in the container. And it's a similar story with allspice that if you grate it fresh. It's pretty potent, so just that little bit and that flavors the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, the spices are one of those really current timeline things that people just don't really understand. Like, you just don't really, really realize things. There was spice wars. Like, yeah. there was global wars over just spices. Just getting, like, 
spice roots. Like it was a, a thing for entire history. Like people make fun of like, oh, they say like, oh, European or white people don't use flavored foods and things like this. But you got to realize they were developing dishes and things like that long before they had access to anything besides basic herbs that grew in Europe. Like this whole idea of just having like the things that, but, and now they start to incorporate them in a lot of the dishes that you see and others is a different kind of take on it. But, but there's also some positives of, personally for me, I don't like using too many actual spices. And I like using the whole spices, as you said, like I don't like using garlic powder. I prefer to actually just use actual garlic Take the time to chop it down and put it in a food processor, for example. If you're going to have black pepper, just get the peppercorns, get that grinder. And now with that same grinder, you can probably get a lot of other fresh things and do that. Like cinnamon, most people don't know don't, cinnamon is actually like a stick. It's like an actual yeah. rod that you can have. Vanilla, there's actually those like b- those beans that you can have that has like seeds. It's kind of like a dried up um, green like a green bean type of thing. There's, there's, there's ways to get these things. And you're all out there, again, it's another thing that I'm telling people, if you're listening to this, you probably like food enough to actually think of stepping your game up or you're already somebody that is actually doing these things. Do that extra step to actually get as close to the whole food that you saw. Get familiar with it. Doesn't mean you shouldn't have or it's bad to have these powder ones for a pinch, like pun intended, if you just have them in there and you can, you can have access to those. Or you get the actual whole thing and then you get it down into a powder form and you, you keep that in your place. Because even those ones that you're getting from the stores, you don't know how long they've been there. Sometimes it's been years. No, like probably not years. But it could have been a lot longer than you're getting them off the shelf. So even getting the actual thing and then getting it into that powder form in your own home in a nice airtight sort of a container, that, that could be something to kind of consider just as doing. I think it will improve your whole experience with these spices and flavors. And Don't take it for granted just that you can get these things millions of people died for just yeah. simple spices well i would add to cinnamon is actually a bark a lot of people forget it because if you notice the way it's curled because you mm-hmm. they pull the bark off then it dries up and it sort of like wraps like that and the same thing fresh cinnamon i mean if you have fresh versus the powdered it's a lot stronger like that's another one you either take a microplane or if you have a spice grinder what you typically do is you throw it in spice grinder coffee bean grinder similar thing you grind it up as fine as you can and it's hard to get super fine so what I and others will do is you'll often get like grind it up as much as you can get a sieve run it through that and then shake out whatever powder you can because the little fragments of cinnamon will stay in the thing and then with vanilla bean vanilla bean comes dried already but a lot of people don't know there's a whole process with harvesting vanilla beans where it's like you have to let it lay out in the sun you have to cover it let it sit for a bit lay it out in the sun cover it you have to do that like three or four times or something and then That bean you get is dried out, and then when you scrape it out, the inside, that's the seeds. That's usually what you see in vanilla ice cream and everything. The little black specks are the seeds inside the pod. So what a lot of people do, and I've done this too, is they'll simmer the pod in something, but then you strain the pod out, but then the the little specks, the seeds stay inside because those look appetizing. Yeah, a lot of these spices in, in their actual form, they don't dissolve. Like, that's something with, like, no. cinnamon. It doesn't dissolve. No. <laughs> in, like, teas and things like that. Like, it's just, you, you get the flavor out of it. So, yeah, it's uh, the seeding out of straining the, the actual uh, granules out is, is normally a key part of, of using some of these things. But, yeah. Okay, so um, moving on to the next one here, we have the Dolly Blossom, which is Nolet's gin, Nolet's, it's a Nolet, Nolet's gin, Moscato, and orange blossom water. I just, I just want to start by saying off. This was a very very girly drink. I only had it <laughs> one. I only had it once. It's super sweet. Like this is there's a term you I think you've said it before yourself. Cloyingly sweet. Like they talk about that with ice wine. That's kind of how I felt about this. Like it's it's something that like even for me is too sweet. Like I like sweeter cocktails. Even for me it was like too much. Like I'm trying to think of what you would have this with. Even it's either a really sweet drink you'd have at the end of the meal, or I don't know, maybe pair it with something that like counters it a little. It's it, it was really strong. I mean, I don't know. It was, I mean, I'm not going to say it was bad. They did a good job, but it's just like, it was too sweet for my taste. Like the gin and then Moscato, for those who don't know, that's a dessert wine. There's actually a, um, there's a, well, in French, it's Muscat. Moscato is Italian. Moscato d'Asti is the famous one. That's a sparkling Moscato, typically common for dessert. Uh, it's grown, it's grown everywhere though. I mean, there's Piedmont. It's grown in Alto Adige. That's in the North east of italy for those who don't know it's grown in california it's grown in australia spain germany all that originally originally moscato is from piedmont though um it ranges in different colors there's yellow there's red it's typically 
It smells almost like people have compared it to there's orange blossom, honeysuckle, uh, some have said ginger. It's like it's definitely on the sweeter side, though. Like this is it, Moscato is typically a dessert wine. The gin does offset it a little, but I still felt it like it was very sweet, at least in my opinion. And then mm. orange, bl orange blossom water that sort of complements the Moscato as well. But it's also to, I guess, dilute the flavor a little. It still tasted very sweet, though. So I don't know. Maybe they just put a lot of Moscato and I'm not sure. <laughs> So no, this one, it's um, orange blossom water, so it's just infused, like they just put water and they put some orange blossoms into it and let it sit for some time? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, yeah, so, but you, you mentioned, what do you have with the aristocrat? I didn't ask you for that. You remember the what aristocrat, you I, I, I don't remember what I had with it. I was trying to think of things that can go with... I was trying to think of things that would go with that, though, because I think you could even do like a beef dish. Like, oh, I was thinking maybe actually the Korean uh, baby back ribs that we had at the beginning because the spices would pair well together. And mm -hmm. uh, bourbon, bourbon, a lot of people like whiskey with steak. So I was thinking like something with red meat, that spice blend. You could do, oh, you could do the bao buns with this. That would go well. I think the spice blend as well, the sauce there. Um you could, you could maybe, maybe the, I don't know, the burger wouldn't be the best. I think your best bet would probably be the bow bunts and the baby back ribs. So. Right. Yeah, and you say with the Dolly Blossom, we, we have, it's, it's a bit of, it's a bit of a go. But uh, yeah, yeah. it's Dolly Blossom. Um, yeah, we talked about gins already, so we've already had a little outside on that. I was just, we, I just had an orange before we had this recording, and just oranges are just so simple. But when you get that. I mean, this happens a lot of fruits, I guess, but that orange just said the tartness of it's right with the sweetness and just the, the juiciness when you bite into it, when the, you can still tell the freshness when you, when you're biting into the fruit, like the, the spritz comes out of the, <laughs> out of the, um, what's it called, out of the peel. And one thing I normally do is I just keep the peels. I use it a lot in like baking, just get like a small grater and like grate the, the zest out into it. You can also dry it. You can put them in rice or you can put them when you're cooking, frying up meats or things like that, or baking things you can or oven, oven roasting things especially if you're doing some um kind of closed up wrapped up ro roasting with meats and different things like that you can put some orange peels in there and get the flavor in there this is some some of the different ways to use this orange is just it's it's a typical fruit but it's still such a good fruit <laughs> like despite it despite it being just like rather like apples and oranges you know they're kind of the basic things but i think actually trying to think like if i was told to pick losing one apples or oranges like, i think i would lose apples for like the rest of my life because orange yeah i don't know okay um, I, think, I love i love orange with chocolate too by the way i think that's a great pairing mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and so now with, with this also just the with the blossoms a lot of really a lot of plants have really cool blossoms that people are not familiar with and that infusing thing is also another thing that i'm i'm really big on right now I really like drinking water like <laughs> gallons of water a day and in different sorts of infusions is a kind of good way to just add some different kind of taste of the peels like blossoms and things like that a lot of people don't really have familiar familiarity with actually the plant this plant cycle of some of these things like with figs fig trees get massive like these get old these keep growing there's really massive fig trees like first time i was like oh, i've never seen some fig trees like holy crap these massive ones like really old ones here in kenya and some places in nairobi and um my favorite one of my favorite flowers favorite plants looking type of things the passion fruit flower this really amazing looking flower this is this is kind of like it looks a bit like the silk floss flower but not no, it's a bit more understated than the silk floss flower but yeah i hadn't really thought in mind what, what an orange blossom looked like you, you just yeah. made me think of a story at my old uh, when i worked at the retirement home my boss saying to me he's like you ever see how cherries grow they grow in bogs i'm like cherries grow bogs i'm like dude you're thinking of cranberries he's like oh what did cherry trees grow in then? He was like, I was like, what did cherries grow in? I'm like, trees. He's like, I was like, George Washington and the cherry tree. I'll never tell a lie. He's like, oh, I learned about that 20 years ago, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the cherry blossom trees. They're not called cherry blossoms. Well, the cherry blossoms, do they even get cherries? Yeah, they do. Yeah. They do. Yeah, they get, they get yeah. blossoms. Yeah, they're blossoms. Well, because it, it's funny you bring that up, actually, because my mother, um, Christine, and I were, and, and dad too, we're probably going to go to Brooklyn Botanical Gardens because they have cherry blossoms that are in season. Uh, I think starting this month or next, like they, they track them well. Like they'll tell you, like, okay, they're in bloom mm -hmm. now, so we're going to go see them. But it's, there's like, we were talking about going in the last month or so, but things are just starting to come up here where there's not much to see. But next month is the prime season because that's when all the flowers are in bloom. Yeah. It, it really is pretty cool. Like the DC, like the, the, the water basin area there with like the, the walk to like the mall down the Potomac way passes through there, the Cherry Blossom Festival. It's really is rather amazing. Of course, it's not 
as big and amazing as it is in Japan where the actual trees came from, but it still is something uh, something to see just the pinkness and all that stuff. If you get the chance, definitely go check it out. Sure. But yeah. Okay, so the next one here. Uh, there seems to be one here that doesn't really have a name. No, no, it's, a, a it's, the, same. it's the same. Oh, it's the same. It's the same one. Drink, two glasses okay, so here. why is it darker? It's just uh, the light. It's the light in the background. Oh, you're saying, or was, is it light in the background? Or... Yeah, the, sec the second one, because the Are they using right... the different Moscato? Wait, you're, you're talking about the, the the two red drinks coming up? That's, that's the it, same Oh, drink. it's the two red drinks are the same ones. Okay, yeah. so it's just a different kind of presentation of yeah. them. I thought maybe... I thought I saw like a blossom or flower in the top one, so I thought it maybe is, it the is, same yeah. with like a different Moscato. No, no. Uh, okay, so both of the next ones are the Scarlet Punch. Yep. Okay, so Scarlet Punch, which is Pomp and Whiskey Gin, Malbec, and Spiced Apple Cider. Pomp and, Pomp and Whiskey Pomp. Gin. Yeah. So back so to the first gin. So I, I like this drink a lot, actually. So for those who don't know, Malbec is a varietal. It's actually from Bordeaux originally, uh, the region in France. Now, what happened was a combination of it became less popular, but also Malbec, they say it's hard to grow. It's very susceptible to drought, frost, um, pestilence, all this. And what happened was a lot of it actually got wiped out. So they brought a lot of a lot of it to Argentina to keep it safe. And what ended up happening was it thrived in Argentina. So with Argentinian wine, this is considered one of the main varieties now. Now, it was brought back to France later, but it, it lost prestige to like Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, all those. Um, it's a it's it's definitely a more tannic wine uh that book that laura recommended that i was reading um i would describe it as the tannins are bigger and more coarse so i definitely feel it in your mouth compared to cabernet sauvignon or something that's on the drier side um i like malbec a lot though and it, it works well with this because the gin you have some of the botanicals but then the spiced apple cider they make it a little sweet but not too sweet so it's this balance of like dry wine a little bit sweet a little bit of spice which goes well with the wine as well and the botanicals from the gin uh this is a drink i tried a bunch of times this is on the winter cocktail menu this i would recommend pairing with um either the steak or the burger or something i think it would go very well yeah yeah i was thinking this apple cider was something i was thinking of, of trying to make my own and um, i mean i just i just need to get into a situation where i can start investing in these tools you, you said you did a bit of shopping for for um your little lady's place to get more into cooking it's even yeah. right now he's living in a rather small place i'm also living in a, in a rather secluded place i don't really have the ability to actually get a lot of the things i would like to get both of us have considered in, in the future getting into more of these things where i think yeah it just seems there's so many cool things to try with some of these things like with spice you know this spiced apple cider i've talked about this for the mulled wine type of idea of like putting like spices and things what spices do they normally put in spiced apple cider i mean typically cinnamon clove nutmeg i've seen some people do jun juniper berries again that's kind of like what i was saying before about the gin like everyone tweaks it i've seen lemon zest too i think or uh, orange zest yeah. Oh, or is this apple cider? So, hmm. I'm trying to wonder how those two tastes would work together. You're trying. Basically, I think what it is is you want something that complements and works with the flavor, but not something that's so far out there that it becomes too distinct. And that's kind of what I was saying above about some of these cocktails: is it's striking that balance of flavors that work well together, and not something that is so contrary that it just it because it just tastes ends up tasting like that other flavor you're trying to sort of strike that balance uh. yeah because i was thinking of doing some banana bread today we had some crab apples and we made like a more like a, 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 a sort of paste with the with the crab apples as it's oh. kind of going bad i was thinking of mixing that with bananas we had this like sweet this ladyfinger bananas from some trees back here and i was wondering if i was just going to use vanilla extract to to, to add to that or use coconut milk or use I guess some orange zest. Maybe I'll put the orange zest just with the. Yeah, I think what I'll do is I'll make the batter, and I'll just put some of that orange zest on the on the top, so it's on the crust and not necessarily in the actual banana bread. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll figure it. I'll figure it out. I don't know. Because I'm just wondering that apple, uh, the apple, and I guess because it's cider already. So, hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know how those two tastes would mix. Yeah, I mean, I think I've I've had orange with apple before. I think it goes well. Oh, I used to make what was it? Um. No, wait, what was that? There was a cranberry apple pie. That's what that was. That worked pretty well together because the apple sweeter, cranberry okay. is tart, some of those flavors, yeah. like where they sort of play off. Like you have a sweeter apple, you have the tartar cranberry, the sugar sweetens both, but the cranberry is still tart. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. 
OK, so um, on to the next one here. We yeah. have a winter solstice, which is Kettle One Vodka, Contrino, Cointreau, Cointreau uh, pomegranate juice, and cranberry juice, and Ruibos tea. So it's a uh, Cointreau. So uh, Cointreau. Yep. So, yep. So this is, uh, let's see here. So yeah, Kettle One Vodka, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Cointreau, it's a triple sec liquor. It's made from, it's, it was actually started by uh, Adolphe Cointreau. Adolphe is the French version of the name. A uh, confectioner and his brother, who was Edouard Jean Cointreau. So originally they were experimenting for his cherry liquor, but then they started blending sweet and bitter oranges with and uh, pure alcohol made from uh, beet sugar. So they, really, they, really, they found out that like, okay, if you use the bitter oranges, you use the alcohol, but there's also a little bit of the sweet orange. So it has that flavor mm -hmm. of you kind of, I don't know if you've tried Quantra Silas, but you'll notice you, uh -huh. yeah, it, it has like a little bit of the bitterness, a little bit of the sweet. They say to this day, the recipe and the methods are actually a secret, uh, but they allow, they allow, um, you know, tours of their facility, but you're not allowed to take pictures or other things. Um, I've had Cointreau on its own. Typically, you've seen it in things like Crepe Suzette or um, I'm trying to think there's other dishes like that. Um, you know, like dishes where you flambe because the alcohol content is high enough. 40% uh, alcohol by volume, uh, but it's still sweet, so you can do different things with those flavors. So like Crepe Suzette. I'm trying to remember something else. Grand Marnier, of course, is a um, fairly similar. I don't know if I would say... I, I don't know. I, I think the production is fairly similar, but I mean, obviously, brand name is different, and I think they probably tweak the recipe a little bit. Let's see what else here. And then Roybus is actually from South Africa. It's caffeine free. Um, trying to think of how I would describe it here. Yeah, it's it's like an herbal tea. It's not it's not as strong as black tea. It's um, yeah, the tea the tea leaves are oxidized. They get kind of this. I don't know if I would say nutty flavor. I'm trying to think of. See, I mean, it's it's used. It's it, people kind of compare it to black tea. It's not as strong though. It doesn't have the caffeine. But like I like I would drink it sometimes like later in the day because it's like I'm not going to be up from the caffeine, but it still tastes nice. So that adds flavor as well. And I think the juices are pretty self-explanatory. So this this was a nice drink. It wasn't my favorite, but I thought it was good overall. Yeah. Yeah, and here we're getting that color is coming from the tea mostly. From what I'm seeing here, the rebus tree tea seems to be a very reddish drink that they have here. What food did you have paired with it? I think this this was another one. I, th I think I think I might have actually had one of the duck dishes with this. I'm trying to remember now. I think this would I think this would work well because I feel like it's a little stronger because of the tea and because of the juices. But at the same time, it would be too mild for something like a beef dish, but maybe like pork or duck because it's fattier, but it's not super strong. So I think it would kind of work well with something like that. Yeah. Okay. Now, what do we? I, we didn't mention this. It's not on the on the menu here. They have the they have prices for wines and things like that. What is what's the price ranges for these cocktails? Um, I mean, fourteen, eighteen bucks. I want to say. Okay, so it's, yeah, it's, it seems to be a decent price for New York City. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like the the neighborhood and things like that. And as as mentioned, it's not just vodka. It's not just is vodka and coke a drink. I mean, I mean, Jack and Coke is common. Jack I mean, and Coke. It's not just Jack whiskey. and Coke where it's just like two, two. It's like it's not just like two parts mixer, one part thing. It's they're actually putting some thought into it. So I think that that price range is not necessarily a bad thing from from what we've seen them actually presenting here. Yeah, because because I was gonna say maybe we can do one in the future at that place I like called what's it called Analog because they have some really creative stuff there. Like that's the one where they have like the Emperor's Gin with like egg whites. They have this matcha tea with like hibiscus and all this elaborate stuff. And that's one of those places you're spending like 18, 20 bucks a drink. But I mean, it's it's creative stuff. Like it's stuff like I wouldn't come up with and make on my own at home. So like, I don't mind getting it. I don't mind getting a few drinks there, but I mean, I wouldn't go there every week either because you know, you're going to spend some money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, I don't really have too much to say on that one. And then we can jump on to the next one here. Sure. We have the 23 Skidoo, yep. which is vodka, St. Germain, um, peach, and passion fruit. This looks peach and passion fruit, two of my two of my favorite, two of my preferred fruits. So this, this looks like a like a good drink. 
Well, th this was really nice. And I like, I like too with this because the portion is a good size. You'll notice it's in a full <laughs> glass, so you, you get a lot of it. And I think the alcohol content is probably about on par with the other ones, but there's just more juice and other things, so you get there's more volume. So vodka, I didn't get the brand name. Saint Germain, for those who don't know, that's an elderflower liqueur. I think we. We might have talked about it a bit in the seasonal presentation. I noticed in both Austrian places, we used it quite a bit, both in drinks as well as desserts. Really nice. It pairs well with a lot of different things. Um, and then peach and passion, passion fruit, those were the juices. Definitely more peach because passion fruit's very sour for those who don't know. So it's mostly peach and like a little bit of passion fruit for flavor. Some sprigs of mint on top. This was good. I definitely got a bunch of these. This was on the summer menu, I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so what is the, the meal that you think would go good with this? But this seems like That's something it. you can just go and you can have maple vinegar with the appetizers, those wings. It's kind of a thing where, like you said, it's also a lot. So it's something you can just have with something small that's not the, the primary thing. Yeah, I mean, you could even, you could do this. So I was thinking maybe with like a cured fish dish or something, like some like cured hamachi, like yellowtail, maybe something like milder like that. Like maybe on a hot summer day, you have some like light cured fish dish. You drink this aside with it. I think that would be nice. Something like that, maybe. Um, you could even... I mean, I don't know. You could have it as a dessert, even. I mean, it's it's not super sweet, but it's sweeter. You could do that. Mm -hmm. It's this is this to me is one of these drinks. I think like you would just sit outside and sip on like a hot day. Like if you have like a nice, if it's like a hot day and you have like a nice porch outside, you just sit outside and drink. Yeah, maybe make like a pitcher of it and just pour yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it definitely looks like a good one. Peach and passion. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a thing. The Saint Germain bottle is a rather interesting bottle. Like, yeah. like this slim bottle. St. Germain written on it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. I have to look more into what the connection with the Austrians and the elderflowers is, because that's this is from France, and I know it's big in French stuff as well. But I noticed that the Austrian places we had elderflower foam, there was elderflower gel. I'm trying to remember if there was an elderflower sorbet even at one point. Maybe I'm thinking of something else. And then it was used in drinks as well. So they seem really fond of it. I'm not sure why though. Uh. Okay. Yeah. Um jumping on to the next one. I mean, some of these things we've already talked about the drinks and stuff before, so it's like we really have too many more questions about what vodka is. <laughs> so there are <laughs> peaches and, and passions that kind of self. So we already talked about the passion flower before. Okay, so the next one, fallen oats. Is like something like Holland oats? I'm trying to think of the names. Is yeah, um, bourbon, uh, bourbon liquor. Then no bourbon. Then liquor forty three, cinnamon powder. Then the oat milk. As you mentioned there with the cinnamon, that's you see the powder there. That stuff's not. It's not going to dissolve into it. It's just going to be the powder. Yeah. And so, another thing with cinnamon, it really floats. Because like you said, it's the bark. It's actually just wood. So it's something that if you put it in, whatever you're putting it into, it's going to float to the top as well. So this was on the fall menu. You could probably tell by the name. So bourbon, of course, bourbon whiskey. Liqueur 43 is actually a vanilla uh, flavored liquor. It comes from Spain. Uh, very popular in Mexico as well, as well as the Netherlands and U.S. So that gets mixed in. It's on the sweeter side, as you can probably tell. Um, cinnamon, of course, freshly grated over top. And then the oat milk is mixed in with the liqueur 43 and bourbon. So it's a balance of you have, okay. you know, because you figure – the first two on their own would be kind of strong. So the idea is that the first two are basically flavoring the oat milk, which makes up the bulk of it. And then the fresh cinnamon is grated over top. And um, the the milk is also foamed up a little. So like there's that, you know, layer on top and then cinnamon's grated last minute. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of tiramisu the way it has it on the top there, but it's only like coffee powder when you do it. No, it's actually, yeah, it's cinnamon when they do the cup tiramisu. Um, Hmm. So with this one, yeah, uh, what was the, the food you you went with? Hmm, I'm trying to think here. I mean, I, I oh, I think I had this as a dessert. Yeah, yeah, I think I had this at the end as a dessert because I was like, they were saying, the two other people working there were saying, we like this a lot, but it's very sweet. Like, I don't know if you mm -hmm. want to have it with your meal. And I was like, instead of getting a dessert, why don't I have this? But I was thinking of those desserts we reviewed up above the apple tart tatin and the um pumpkin panna cotta i think these would this would go great with that because you have the same vanilla vanilla cinnamon all those flavors work really well yeah, yeah. if you're going to have if, if there's something if there's some kind of part of the of the meal that you can have like a milk tea with or or, or a cafe latte with that this is probably something you could probably substitute in there um i haven't been asking with the vodka ones, I can imagine those are chilled. With the gin ones as well, have any of these been room temperature? Like, which are the room temperature liquors are supposed to be 
you know, are there any liquors that are really, like, you, of course, you have the whiskeys, but the whiskey's supposed to be room temperature, then you add the ice. Are there liquors or drinks that are supposed to be just room temperature without any ice? That's a good question, because that's sort of the debate about should you have ice or not, because some people prefer the cold sensation, but then many people would argue that room temperature with wine and liquor both that the flavor is more potent when it's room temperature, because when wines and things are chilled, the flavors get muted a little. So if you want to really appreciate the full flavor, you should have them room temperature, but some people just prefer the sensation of having it colder. So it's sort of up to the person. I mean, if you prefer the sensation of colder liquor, colder wine, but the flavor's muted a little versus if you want fuller flavor, but it's going to be warmer, which may not be as pleasant. So you have to kind of weigh, it's based on what the person asks for typically. So that's why, yeah. like when you order whiskey, they always ask straight up or on the rocks because it depends on which way that person goes. Yeah. yeah, now I'm trying to think with me on my whiskey days. Yeah, I because I did mine whiskey straight up. Huh. A certain yeah, of course, it like depends on the whiskey, though. Well, certain things too, like, I mean, like, like for example, I had Lagavulin in the scotch that was made famous in Parks and Rec. Like, that I have straight because it's it's smoky, but it's very smooth. So it's like, if you put ice in that, it waters it down and you can tell you lose something. But it's, it's, it's also a very well-made whiskey, so it's like, you really want to appreciate it fully. Like... A comparison I was I was talking to Christine about actually we were talking about mushrooms and I bought some morel mushrooms the other day and served them uh, at our the meal we made they're expensive though they're 70 bucks a pound uh, so not something I buy all the time but what I was saying to her was I thought about mixing them in or something but I was saying something like morel mushrooms I want to keep separate because they're expensive and distinct so yeah. it's like you want them on their own whereas if you're pureeing or mixing in you want to use something cheaper that if it gets lost like you don't really care like if you're like at Eddie and the Wolf, the sister restaurant to seasonal, we had spetzla and we had sauteed mushrooms inside it. But what it is, is we sauteed trumpet royale or another mushroom that was cheaper because it gets mixed in. So you don't care as much. Whereas something that's expensive and distinct, you want that on top or separate because you really want to taste it by itself. It's a similar it's a similar thing with some of these drinks like you use a cheap whiskey, you mix that in with other stuff, but like a really long aged, well made whiskey, you want to taste on its own because you want to taste the full flavor. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Yeah. And also, yeah. So the, the, the rums and the whiskeys. Yeah, I think the darker, the darker, the more room temperature. They're they're they preferred. I guess the amarettos as well. No, amaretto is supposed to be. I don't know because like I just remember one of my friends, Rocco. Yeah, you met Rocco. Yeah, yeah. he <laughs> we used to we used to kind of he, he black seal is is this rum from Bermuda, and we used to kind of like do play these jokes and when we put it in the freezer you'd be like super pissed because like when you put the rum in it really like condenses and yeah it, it's syrup it syrupizes so yeah with that aspect that is supposed to be a prefer an actual good thing for vodka but for some some rums and some rum enthusiasts it's blasphemy to actually do it that way but yeah so those are those are some of the room temperature ones so yeah yeah because like with lagavulin or something like you can order it on the rocks but they're gonna like i mean Good service. They're not going to look at you funny or make fun of you, but at the same time, <laughs> but at the same make time, fun it, in the back. Yeah, because it's like it's one of those things. Like it's just, it, it's like you're kind of, like with my mushroom comparison, it's like you're just sort of diluting the value of something that's very like distinct on its own. And it's like, what's the point? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Now on to the next one here. We have, although wait, oh, you said it was a dessert thing as we mentioned. Okay, so the yeah. next one here, we have a cold fashioned, <laughs> good yeah. name, they have good names here. <laughs> yeah. So cold fashioned, which is a Johnny Walker black label, then Averna Amaro, a stout, a cold brew coffee, and maple syrup. And then of course, the second the second image here, you have uh, an addition of Bailey's ice, Irish ice cream foam and dark chocolate. So that's one thing I was thinking also with like the finding ways to infuse different things that I'm wondering, I guess I'm wondering, would, would Rocco really object to something like a black seal ice cream? So it's like black seal base, but it's cold. I, I don't know, <laughs> but he didn't mind. He didn't, that, that's the thing. He just didn't like the black seal in the freezer, but when he was having the tasty beverages that he made, it was like the black seal Coke and ice. So when you add stuff to it to chill it down, that's, that's okay. But just don't put like her, part of part of why I like putting my like, whiskey and stuff like that in the freezer during those times was if I was having it with Coke and also especially with like the Johnny Walker when you're not talking about the black label and things like that, just like the red label, the basic type type of one, it would condense a bit and it would have a more of like a caramel sort of flavor and you wouldn't need to add ice to the actual drink. The, the ice, when you add it to the, the drink, it the water dilutes it. So if the vodka is, I mean, if the liquor is, if the whiskey is already cold, and the Coke was already cold, then you just have the cocktail, you just have the drink without the 
the yeah, that's that's why I was freezing some of these things. But go ahead. Yeah, so this is actually one of my favorite drinks there as of late. Now, because there's caffeine in it, it's one of those like I can't have too many late in the day. So if I either go earlier or um, you know, I'll have fewer of them because I mean I, I love coffee stuff in general. So of course this is great for me. Um my friend Chris Vella loves this too because he tends to like darker cocktails like this. He like he's the kind of guy who gets Jack and Coke a lot, and it doesn't it doesn't taste like that, but it's kind of in that category of like darker drinks. So Johnny Walker Black Label, it's a Scotch. It's a blend of single um, single malt, but also blended whiskey, Scotch. For those who don't know, it has to come from Scotland. It has to come from four different regions. I want to say here. Let me see what are they. There's Highlands. Let me see. I have it right here. Where was it? It's one of the common drinks, like Johnny Walker Black. It's it's, it's good, and you'll find it pretty much yeah. at any bar that you go to. It's one of the most well sold. Oh yeah, so. it can only it can only come from four regions: the Highlands, Lowlands, Speyside, and Elay. Elay is an island, and there's different natural resources and terroir and everything. So there's different levels of fruitiness, malt strength, smoke, all that. Um, it's sort of an interesting thing how certain people love bourbon because they love that caramel flavor. Like I have a friend who loves bourbon, but he doesn't like scotch because it's too smoky for him. So it's kind of it's kind of like one of those things like it's a love hate thing. Like I like the smokiness personally. I think it goes really well. I remember I brought a bunch home. My family enjoyed it as well. Lagavulin. It's not cheap. I mean, I think Lagavulin's about a hundred a bottle, so it's not something I buy all the time. But I mean, I think it's worth the money definitely. And I mean, because it's whiskey, it's strong. You're not going to drink a lot at once, and it'll mm -hmm. last a while. So. The Black Label Amaro, we talked a little bit about that. That's that bitter liqueur. Stout, there's the um, beer, typically similar. Think of like a Guinness or something. It's that richer, maltier beer. Cold brew coffee. Coffee, it's been brewed, you know, cold, so it has. it's not diluted with ice or anything. Maple syrup, we make it a little sweeter. And then the foam, it's a Bailey's Irish cream. I think they put it into a foam gun similar to whipped cream canister, and they just shoot it out, so it injects the... Um, and it's CO2 or NO2. I always mix it up which one they use. And then the chocolate just gets sprinkled on top. Yeah, this is definitely one of my favorite drinks there as of late. I love, like I say, I love coffee, love whiskey. I mean, you know, this I can have like over and over. <laughs> yeah, I most definitely want one of those foam guns. There's yeah. so many things you can do with that. Yeah. So many things I, you can do I, with a foam I gun. I had one at one point. I mean, yeah, I, th I think we were talking right at one point. You can buy one off Amazon. It's not that expensive. Yeah. Like, 40 bucks or something and you just need to buy the canisters and it's like you know unless you're using it all the time the canisters should last you a while so you know pretty good i think my next purchase was is, is, i'm stuck with my phone good but I, I need to i think i'm going to get like a food thermometer because like that's one thing i could well you just like eyeing things but i want to get more specific with these things because they actually is a key thing when you get right to that sweet spot of the heat and the things and when you're making certain specific things like if you want to make like preserves or reductions or some of these things you want to maintain it at a low enough heat where you can't just eye it i mean eventually you do it long enough you could probably just eye it or you know you know your oven or you know your your stovetop enough to know that like at this sort of flame you're going to get this type of temperature but I think yeah, it's, it's going to be a worthwhile thing. You can get them for like 30, 35 bucks here. You can find them for, for that around there. I saw one with the electronic type of one, so it's very, very exact. I think I might might look into getting that. But the foam gun is also on that list of, of things to do because I can just think of so many things. I'm really folding everything up for like maybe like the months after I get it, just like shh. <laughs> everything that, that, that's that's how i am too like once i learn some new technique or something i just want to start doing everything like i was <laughs> yeah. i was discussing i was saying to christine as well how i will actually like i want to make ice creams again i mean it's kind of hard where i live but i was saying like you know if i move into a bigger place i want an ice cream maker and i want to just like make a few different batches of base and just like have like a few little pints of like different flavored ice creams and just you know have them throughout the week like i want to do like basil flavored i want to do like i've seen lavender like just experiment with all these different flavors and like make a little bit of each that way we can try a little bit each day or something and um the other thing i was going to say to you too with the foam gun it's interesting because you can even spruce up like simple sauces like you can do a hollandaise or a bernays just shoot some air into it so it's aerated so like the texture is different on the plate like it sort of dissolves into your mouth uh that's how a lot of that stuff started and i've seen different I've seen different foams too. Like I've seen a mushroom foam. I've seen trying to, there's, there's different foams. Well, I mean, in seasonal, it was made differently, but like there was the lobster foam, the lobster bisque, you had less than two, you reduce it. That was, that's one of my favorites of all time, probably. Oh, we did, we did one with uh duck jus too at Eddie and the Wolf. That was nice. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the roasted duck. And then you have this little like swoosh of like this foam on and you just sort of stick it into it. It was cool. Uh. Cool. 
So y'all out there, if you have one of these foam guns, let, let us know some of your some of your foam experiments. Sure. Yeah. Going to the next one here, we have the Dizzy with a Dame, and here it's some Cruzon Blackstrap Blackstrap Rum, yep. uh, some cinnamon, vanilla, and espresso. So th this is their take on an espresso martini. You can probably tell this is another one of those drinks that's really good. But of course, I can't have it late at night, or I'm going to be up all night. Um, you can, you know. I think pretty self-explanatory. The espresso mixed with the rum, um, the foamed milk uh, on top, and then some some uh, vanilla. Sorry, some cinnamon freshly grated over top. Really nice. Okay, so you said it's a, their take on an espresso cocktail. Is this like a common the, thing? That espre they have espresso, around? espresso martini. Typically, espresso it's espresso martini. Yeah, typically yeah. it's a, it's, pre, it's espresso vodka. Um, you know, usually cinnamon vanilla as well. It's like like when people because it's one of those those things that people come in and will ask for a lot like oh can I get an espresso martini so then this is like kind of their play on this yeah. okay yeah I used to do that as well too when you have like the the gin rummies I'd, I'd try and like you know different things instead of using gins I'd use the same kind of kind of idea but then you use other other sort of liquors and things like that because yeah I would think um, hmm I'm trying to remember do Black Russians have any coffee in it now. I think, yeah, maybe because I just wasn't that big of a, I've never been that big of a coffee drinker, so I hadn't never really thought of coffee as with a liquor type of base, but I'm surprised they would go with vodka rather than a rum or, or whiskey as as the accompaniment. I knew they, with the Baileys, they occasionally put it in coffee. Is it also like rum, the thing that they, you no know, whiskey, is it whiskey or rum that they normally put like a little shot in coffee when you have, it's a primarily coffee drink there. It's not yeah, vodka, it's, so it's kind of... Well, what you refer, I think what you're referring to is there's like Irish coffee, which has like Bailey's whiskey and other things. And now there's like Mexican coffee, which is like Kahlua, tequila and coffee, things like that. And okay. yeah, and there's like there's different things like that. And then I guess in the South, they'll put um, because like Jeffrey Tucker wrote that book Bourbon for Breakfast. And there's that um, there's that uh, what is it called? Yeah, Bourbon for Breakfast, where like in the morning, they'll actually put a shot of bourbon in the coffee. But remember, bourbon has that vanilla caramel flavor so that kind of complements the coffee where something like scotch would be smokier so when i mean i guess you could do scotch and coffee i don't know but i, I, I don't know i feel like it would be because coffee is kind of bitter that's kind of smoky i don't know i don't think that would be too pleasant no yeah so for some if you're doing a martini you're kind of substituting the water aspect of it and if you're doing more of a of course you're doing the, well, uh, the baileys you're like substituting the milk aspect i don't, I don't know it, well, it, just, it just seems odder for my martini well, remember, martinis are either vodka or gin based, so it's like that's what it's yeah. a play on. Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> vodka, vodka is neutral. Like you wouldn't do gin and espresso because that'd be kind of. I mean, you could, but it'd be kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> like it's too, it's I too guess, distinct yeah. of a flavor. Uh. Also, was not a big fan of martinis, so I guess that's also part of I'm why not this is not really yeah. something that I would have, would have had. So, uh, as, what did you have this with? I think this was another thing I had towards the end of a meal. It was one of those things like I had late and I shouldn't have, and then my sleep was all screwed up because it's <laughs> like it's like you feel buzz from the caffeine and the alcohol, and then like you feel tired and I don't know. It's like it's it's a nice drink, but yeah, don't have one late at night at least unless you're you know, I don't know. Certain people can handle it. Like my father's funny that way. Like my dad. My dad will drink coffee at like seven or eight at night, and then he he stays up late anyway. But then he goes to sleep fine. So I don't know. I guess some people. I don't know if you get used to it or what, but <laughs> yeah, that's a similar thing with me. I didn't really get any. I don't. I don't really feel that that rush from the caffeine rush from from actually. Maybe now if I, had, I yeah, it wasn't that much of drinking. There was some time where for like a year I was drinking coffee. wasn't really feeling that even when I was younger and occasionally have it. I don't know. Maybe there's a tiny boost like right after, but it's not like a long lasting yeah. sort of sort of thing with me. But yeah, as you mentioned, that's a different thing. Some people eat beans and die. Most people eat beans and just get the protein out of it and put on muscle and stuff. So yeah, it's uh, different folks, different strokes. Yeah, because okay. for me, it's like uh, I, what happens with me with this stuff is like I'll feel buzz and then like I'll crash and then I'll fall asleep and I'll just be up all night. So it's like, <laughs> you know, something with adrenaline glands and yeah, I don't know, but they say actually that's advice I read years ago. Like if you have like um, coffee or an espresso first thing and then you sleep like 20 minutes, like you wake up feeling well rested and I've done that a few times. Yeah. Mm. I'm not sure the exact reason, like something about it kicking in and then like you're woken up and then you're just up, you know? So I don't know. Yeah. 
So on to the next one here. The orange, that's an orange blossoms back again. Is that something else? It looks like the I'm orange so, blossoms. I'm, like not sure what, I'm not sure what flower. Now, hibiscus would be red. I'm not sure what flower no. this is. I've seen it a lot, but I don't know the name or type. Okay, so this is a Harlem sunset, which is a Lunazul Blanco tequila, St. Germain again, hibiscus, is hibiscus, 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 hibiscus. I say I say hibiscus. I say hibiscus, but I don't know. Maybe okay. the the English say it differently. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, and lemon. Then you have ice shaped into a rose in the middle. Yeah, it's kind of looks like a rose. Yeah. So, well, what what I was gonna say, what's interesting is that they used to. You you were talking about those ice molds earlier, and typically I just used to see them as circles or squares. Mm -hmm. But I've noticed they started selling shaped ones, which is good because like. When I started at Netta, they used to have shaped ice, but it was annoying. Like they would have to actually chit, like take this like chisel and like will. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it just seems like so much work. And it's like if you can get like a mold that's shaped like a flower that's like upside down, pour it in, freeze yeah. it, flip it out. You know, it's like why go to all the trouble? I'm sure if you go online, there's probably all sorts of shape. Like I've seen, I've seen triangles. I've seen you could do lots of different stuff. Yeah, yeah they have the kind of like flexible, rubbery type of uh, yeah it, ice I, ice shoots now. I think it's made. I'm not 100 percent sure. It's either rubber or silpat. Silpat we might have talked about. It's a fiberglass it's type of thing. Yeah. yeah. So it, it it bends to the different shapes. Then you just pour whatever you want, and yeah. So tequila. For those who don't know, it's made from the agave cactus. That's you know big in Mexico, of course. Saint Germain. We talk about elderflower. Hibiscus. I think it's hibiscus. I'm not sure. I'm not sure in here if it was juice or syrup. It wasn't overly strong. Hibiscus for me, it has a flavor, but it's more about color because of the distinct red color. A um, little bit of lemon mm -hmm. juice. And then, of course, the rose. If you notice, too, the icon of the restaurant, it's the rose Dolly Varden because the style of outfit, there's usually a flower on the hat. So it's sort of in honor of that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a lot of red drinks here. Yeah. What, what, what did you have this one with? This was another one. I think I had it after the meal, but I'm not. Uh, I, this was in the summer. This was last summer, I want to say. So I think I just had it after. Yeah. Yeah. Some of these seem to be more like yeah, dessert cocktails where you can have it at the end, or you can just have it at the start with like an appetizer. I was thinking yeah. that's like if you're just in there, he's having it with an appetizer. Maybe you're meeting and then you're going to like a party after or something. I don't know what do people, what what do, what do they, what is the youth? <laughs> <laughs> what did New York New Yorkers do? I don't remember that. Well, it's like it's been, it seems like it's been so long ago. Was it like what 2018? That is like four years. <laughs> it was like four years ago. A long thousands of years. But so yeah, um, yeah. I guess if you're just going out, maybe if it's a more like a lunchtime thing where you step in, like okay, it's an afternoon thing. It's not like your main thing. Have that. Have the wings, or just have an appetizer, or maybe the fried polenta with it. Yeah, maybe you with the fried polenta because it's like more of a take on something with the, the maize and things like that. Could be something with that. And then you go out and you go to your party or you go to watch a movie or you do something else after that. I, mean, I think it could be something like that. Hmm. Yeah. So St. Germain in there with the tequila kind of playing off each other. They yeah, had the hibiscus. Like I like the, the tea itself. It's like pretty good. It's just like the flowers of it. it has a very unique taste to it. And yeah. Very red, like yeah, it's very very red. <laughs> yeah, well, in, in the culinary school, we actually had a uh, it was a tea. It was called the ruby sipper, and it was actually a hibiscus and blood orange. And it was nice because, oh, wow. well, yeah, because the blood orange, you figure it's the flavor, but the color doesn't like. I mean, you, the the fruit itself has color, but if you were to steep it, you wouldn't see any color in the liquid. But then the hibiscus is red, so you have the red from the hibiscus and the flavor of the blood orange. So together, it's really nice. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I think we can go on to the last drink that we have here. Yep. And it's, um, it's, it's, it's an interesting picture you have here with like, the eggs. And uh, yeah, I, um, here we have Lincoln's Last Ride. And it's a Monte, Monte Lobo, Monte Lobos Mezcal and a jalapeno infused Contro, a Contro, and a uh, ginger Contro. And a ginger agave or agave yep. uh, lime with a cane sugar and Aleppo pepper rib. Interesting. I guess it's a different take. It's just more their take on a on a margarita, right? Yeah. So I um I wanted to actually pick this one last because this actually won a national award. It won okay. an award. Yeah. It won it won an award. Um. Let's see. What was it here? So. Yeah. So it. Let's see. It was. 
top it was a national award uh, actually from uh Quantro themselves the company actually best margarita of the east in Quantro oh, wow. um and there's also the infatuation um that's a magazine they uh this margarita nation they gave it the awards one of the best in the nation so if you go online, we can maybe post a link. There's actually uh, the recipe. You can find it online. Uh, this is one of those things that's been on the menu the whole time. And of course, they keep it on because they're known for it. And it's a very popular drink. I've had it several times. So, Mescal, for those who don't know, it's you can sort of compare it to tequila, but it has a, a stronger, smokier flavor. It's usually made from. Uh, the heart of the agave plant, usually it's roasted. That's what gives it that strong, smoky flavor. So it's distinct, whereas tequila, tequila is aged various degrees and it gets like stronger depending on how long you age it. But with mezcal, it's just it's roasted again, giving it the smoky flavor. Uh, let's see here. Jalapeno infused Cointreau. So you have the orange, but you also have the jalapenos, which are sort of steeped in this. And if you look up the recipe again, he'll explain like how it was sort of simmered. It was sort of steeped in strained off so you have both the orange as well as the spicy pepper the candy ginger is on top on a toothpick and then lime and then the cane there on the outside there's cane sugar and there's aleppo pepper which is from syria for those who don't remember there was that whole gap with gary johnson what is aleppo aleppo is a place in syria <laughs> well aleppo that's where that's where aleppo pepper comes from and for a little while you actually for a little while, you actually couldn't get it in the States because the war was banned. Like, I remember when I worked at Bar Balloon 2009, 2010, we put it on dishes. And then for a little while, you couldn't get it because of the war. But I guess you could get it again in recent years. So it's um, it's there's uh, sugar on the rim. Sometimes they do salt as well in Aleppo. So it's like sweet, salty, spicy. And, and then it goes as you sip the drink, you get those flavors as well. Really good drink. I've had it several times. I've ordered it with different food I've gotten. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this is some sort of lily flower. I don't know what what kind of flower, what kind of specific lily it is, uh, but that's the shape of a lily. Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah, I wasn't too big on tequila myself. Or not tequila, but I wasn't too big on margaritas. It's just, I mean, they're not bad. It just was okay. Like, I'd rather just have more tequila, like straight. Um, yeah. It's like a shots and things like that, rather than in in a mixed drink. But I understand. I do get the appeal. It's very popular. It's a very popular type of cocktail. And yeah, that's a big glass with the salt in the rim type of thing. It's interesting to now put I mean, the sugar in the rim. But interesting now, you see, you can just add something different. You add the pepper on there it's not, instead of just the sugar. And yeah, you can find some things. And that's that's a positive thing also like about certain places, just being more open to these things. Yes, you can try to make it yourself, and but some people are also just not that good at following directions. But it's also good to have it out there. Now you all can also go get this recipe, and you can play around with it and try some different things. Is it how to be all, you can try maybe with like California ghost peppers. <laughs> Give yourself a real big challenge when you have like <laughs> when you're having your tequila and things like that to, 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 to test it out. Or the, the candy ginger can maybe uh, be something else with that as well. Yeah, I already got that link. So, um, Hmm. Yeah. Well, the, the, the other thing that occurred to me is you could also do espalette, the French pepper, or do something like that on the outside, or fool around different pepper varieties too. And do yeah, because I'm, I'm guessing this Aleppo pepper is not like one of those like we we had a separate video where we talked about the Scoville chart. It's not one of those yeah. like really like ghost pepper type of things. No. They're just gonna like completely scorch your <laughs> your tongue. No, it's usually like where I've used it like Bar Balloon and other places. It's one of those things that you sprinkle on at the end. Like it gives it kind of like we had some I think cured fish dishes, and you would like sprinkle a little bit on at the end. Like it gave like a little bit of like spice, a little bit of a smoky flavor, and that just sort of adds to the fish. So if you did like. If you like a uh, cured hamachi, that's yellowtail, like it's kind of oily. And so then it's like it's cured. So the salt and sugar and the cure brings out the flavor. And then the pepper gives it that spice and smoke at the end, something like that. Yeah. Does alcohol tamp down the we were talking about this. We've talked about this before, but there is no there's the no actual flavor category as as spicy or as, as hot. That's that's not that's just, it's like it's your taste buds dying. <laughs> it's yeah, your taste it's, buds be like, what yeah. are you doing? <laughs> yeah, it's an but, assault. Um, it's an assault on the taste buds, basically. Yeah. yeah. Is is there is there what does alcohol normally do to to hot hot stuff? Like you know, people are like you should drink water. Or you should have a glass of milk or that whole idea that when you're having it. I've, I don't know. In school, they told us that's a myth, the whole water or milk thing. Like, it's like, yeah. it's one of those, like, it makes you feel better initially, but like, it basically just takes time for it to fade. That's all you can do. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, it's just, it's just meant to give like another depth of flavor. So it's like, you know, you have, 
the sweet, you have the orange, and then the jalapeno is like a little bit of spice, but not too much spice. And then um, the tequila has kind of a smokiness. So of course, there's a smoke flavor and all that all that kind of works together. Yeah. Yeah, I saw also someone say something about like having buttery foods before you yeah. go out drinking, like it somehow coats your mouth to the alcohol. I I don't I wouldn't. I actually. Well, it's, it's funny because um, Christine and I actually had these durian uh, popsicles I hadn't had because I've had durian before. And I was yeah. reading that durian, they say, actually interferes with your body's ability to uh, break down alcohol. So they're saying don't eat a bunch of durian and go drinking because you'll get drunk faster. I, was like, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be something that people want to do, depending on. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, that's it with this one. I guess yep. this is also a drink that you can have appetizer you can have it with a meal you can have yeah. it after yeah like i like one time i went with christine i just drank it as we had our meal um one time i think i just had it like oh yeah i think when i went with andrea that one time like i had eaten already so i just sat there and drank that and then yeah you could have it it goes well with a lot of different things i think yeah hmm. yeah and then i think that's that's it for yep. for the for the last cocktail that we have here um that was dolly varden well, it's three yep. parts. There's three parts we did it with. Three parts, two yeah. parts of food, and then this part with the cocktails. And yeah, it's it's been a good place. And as you said, Stephen, the the menu normally changes a bit, and the cocktails keep rotating. And you said like it's coming out to spring, so there's going to be some probably some new things that that are coming up soon, right? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, they they've had the same stuff for a while. That's one reason I haven't been going as much lately because it's like. They've had the same menu for a while, and I've tried a lot of things. My sense is they're in the process of changing, though, because I noticed, for example, recent times they've been running specials, so it's like that's kind of to spice it up a little. But then also um, one of the guys I follow on Instagram, and he's uh, he was posting different drinks recently that he was experimenting with, so I think they're kind of brainstorming ideas. So my guess is that they're probably brainstorming all this stuff, and then once they have their menu set, then they'll get rid of all the old stuff, put everything. They, like, they'll retain Lincoln's Last Ride and other things that – are sort of staples, but then everything else is just going to change. Yeah. 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 And with some of these, maybe if they still have the drink, you can see they have different sorts of drinks. Like you see with the, um, I'm really forgetting the name of the John, was it the Jenny? There were, there were some that were repeated in different ones. And it's just a tactic that most people normally do. If you're going to have an ingredient, try to make like two or three things with that ingredient just to, just to, to work better off. Yeah. And then of course there's some where it's like, okay, this is a key part of it where we can have this just be the star of this alone. And but very few actual ingredients at most bars and restaurants will have that. In food service industry, it's about not just food service industry, most industries, it's just about getting the most you can out of the lowest amount of spending that you have. You get those thin margins that you're working with. And yeah, this if you if you've enjoyed this series, we have a lot more in this series. We have some where we just talk about more like um, this dish on dish is a subsection of doing the you are what you consume series, where we're just talking about other things involved in the food service industry, dealing with food old menus, old recipes, why is this called this? We had an entire one where we were talking about the different changes that it takes from how does lobster go from just being a peasant food to now this is actually like something that's considered like hot, hot cuisine and things like that. So this is, it's just, um, it's it. we, <laughs> we enjoy doing these conversations. And Stephen, thanks as usual for, for spending some time to actually yeah, talk to us you. about these. Okay, so uh, tell us a bit about um, any other thoughts, any closing thoughts you just have in Dolly Barton before we just wind this down? Yeah, again, my one criticism, it keeps being that the menu hasn't changed yet because it's like all the food is great, but it's like I've tried each dish several times. And I think that's been the issue with my like I said, I think when they transitioned with staff, that was probably the issue. But it sounds like they're brainstorming stuff because we're technically in the spring now. So I'm assuming the spring menu will be up pretty soon because you figure June or so, it'll, it's already summer. So it's like, you know, get whatever spring items you can. But I mean, you know, who, know, who knows? Maybe they're working on it. I'm just not sure. But hopefully they'll change because, like, I'd like to go back and try all the new items. But it's like some of these dishes, like the duck and everything, they're good. But it's like, I'm not going to have them six or seven times. It's like, you know, yeah. they're good, but they're well, not. That's more of an issue of you just being a, a regular there rather than <laughs> at the place. Yeah. But, the, but, but, but that's but that's the challenge, as I've talked about before, too, because on the one hand, you want to you want consistency so people come back, but at the same time, you don't want to have the menu stay the same for decades. Cause it's like, unless, unless everything you're doing is so mind blowing, like, and usually like, like, for example, I think I mentioned, I allowed Ducasse, his place has done that for the last like 
30, 40 years, but it's like, he's also a big name chef. So people come there because of his name and all that. But with a lot of these other places, it's more, you keep a few signature items. Like I'm sure Lincoln's last ride will stay on the menu indefinitely, but then everything else can kind of come and go based on seasons, availability, customer feedback, all that. Cause like, I've seen that happen in places too, where if something's very popular, they keep it. Like I mentioned, there was that cheese and pear ravioli at Felidia that um, they tried to take it off the menu and people complained. So it ended up being on the menu 15 years, but it's one of those items that people come back regularly. So it's like, why take it off? But then there's other things. A few people order it. They say, we don't like this. And like, okay, do you want to keep it on or just scrap it for something that people actually want? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah, with Steven, you can find a lot more of his food posting that we haven't talked about or stuff that we've talked about in the past, restaurants that he's been to already that he's still going to and collecting more dishes out there. He's also now is going to start cooking more. I'm also cooking um, more than I have been in the past. You can check out Chefing It Up. It's Chef with the two Fs, It Up. Dot carbon 33com you'll find some of the dishes that I've made there. I'll get Steven to be posting there as well. So, so Steven, what's your Instagram? Uh, it's very boring. It's just Stephen Kirshner, my name, 88. You know, yeah, my, so we'll my... have that on the screen as well or somewhere yeah. below you'll be able to find links. He posts food, also posts extreme assist content. So uh, regressive, ment adult mentality required warning for the regressives. You shall get triggered if you go there without, mm -hmm. without, <laughs> without awareness. And um, yeah, other, otherwise, I think it's been good with this series. Um, what what is, What's next on the docket for the Dishing on Dish series? You said one more... Well, one by sea, two by land. One, one if by land, two if by sea. It's a reference one to Paul land, Revere. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I went, I took Christine there for her birthday. So I'm going to do our meal. I also went once on my own. I got another three course menu. So I think I'm going to, I'm just going to do that. So when we went, we did the three course as well. So it's six courses because we each ordered it. So it's like, we each got a separate two courses for each course. Figure do that. I could talk a little bit about the history of the place, then do also the meal when I went there. And then I might do print restaurant uh, after that. I went once with her, once on my own. I may go one more time just so we have like, you know, we had, I, we had a pasta entree dessert. I had pasta entree dessert. I might get another pasta or an appetizer entree dessert. So we just have like, you know, again, we figure that's what, um, 18, 18 yeah yeah so it's like so the idea is like i want you know i want to have like say six nine something to discuss just so it's like more than like one meal you know yeah the way we've been doing this series so far is we just do these ones they normally range around this hour and a half per section if we're going too much over hour and a half we don't we just cut it off and do like multiple parts of it and uh, we were considering doing more of like shorts if y'all are more interested in those or we just yeah. feel like, okay, maybe something we just made one day and it's like, okay, a meal we want to talk about. Or if it's something where it's like, okay, this is just like, like Steven said, he might have gone to like a restaurant just once and have one dish. Maybe we just do like a quick one. And that might actually be something that we start doing with places that we've talked about at length already. If he goes and he tries something new instead of waiting to like get like another like <laughs> 10 or 20 dishes from a place he's already been to, maybe, oh, there's a new thing on the, on the menu. We'll, we'll talk about that. So let us know if y'all like that way. And with us talking about different things, getting more into cooking, maybe there'll be more like, oh, this is us trying something new. It might be even some live streams or some streaming of actually just cooking and things we'll we'll talk to steven about that and see how we develop that as as time goes yeah, yeah and christine, um christine christine uh -huh. likes recording me as i'm cooking she actually posted some uh -huh. on my uh, facebook page today i told her i want to i want to prepare a little bit more because i just kind of said what was on my mind as i was doing it which is okay but i'm trying to think of like ways i can like streamline everything so it's a demo like have certain things cut up in advance and maybe show me putting it together just so it comes it it comes across as a little more seamless it's not Oh, well, I need this. Where is this? All this because I was also getting used to that kitchen where things are and all that. So yeah. I'm trying to sort of, you know, I think if we do it enough, it's like I'll get used to. Okay, this is here. This is there. This is how. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's it's something that I think it'd be relatively straightforward for us to put up and start doing more of those where we're actually cooking and doing stuff. Because I had thought with this chefing it up idea, we're to have a thing where it's just like, oh, what's in the kitchen today, and then you just kind of get suggestions from other people, or you just have a sort of more open sort of experience through that. So we'll we'll think of we'll think of setting that up in some sort of way. And we normally talk about this after the call, but where are you going to go eat today? I've already had dinner. It's it's already past dinner. We, today was. We had some ugali, there was some uh, nyamachan, which is like, just like roast goat that we had before instead of maybe we boiled it mm. uh, to get it a bit softer. Get the, just, just boiled it with some onions and then some juice greens, random greens that we just have from different places, some traditional greens. That was our, our male meal for today. 
So I might hang out at Dolly Varden. Uh, I might hang out with Chris Vela. I'm not sure. We're trying to figure out our plans. I have some leftovers. So what I may do is I may eat mostly here. Then I may have a drink or something there, but not get like a full fledged meal because I'm trying to get into the habit of using up the leftovers I have. Because I just I don't I just don't like things accumulating going bad. Yeah. I'd rather eat them as soon as I can and then just you know if I get new stuff it's fresh. Uh, Okay, so that's it for me. And uh, as usual, thank you all very much for listening, guys, gals, and everything else in between. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.